I ate one Big Mac a day every day for 30 days, and I lost seven pounds in the process. Today, our guest is Jordan Syatt. You might know him as Gary Vee's former personal trainer. He's also a world record powerlifter, and he's a killer at making cool fitness fact-based content. We talk about how he lost weight eating a Big Mac a day by controlling calories, how he overcame food binging that he developed through intermittent fasting, and how people can reach their fitness goals. All right, enjoy. Hi, right, Jordan, what's up? What's up, man? How are you? Good, good, good. How's your day going? It's amazing. These offices are super nice, so feeling good. Thanks for having me. We're shooting out of the World Trade Center in New York City. The view is unbelievable. Yeah, I love Seriously. it. Um, so, all right, so tell us about the Big Mac experiment. So, uh, I followed it uh, loosely, <laughs> and uh, I think it was, it was really cool, the fact that you could show that you could lose weight uh, irresponsive of the food type, just the, qual the counting of the calories. Yeah, so I think before I even dive into it, I think the first thing I want to preface is saying, I am not saying Big Macs are healthy, and I'm not saying that you should eat more Big Macs, because this is when every, oh, you're promoting more fast food, you're promoting unhealthy habits, it's not what I'm doing. The purpose of the Big Mac Challenge is just basically I ate one Big Mac a day every day for 30 days and I lost seven pounds in the process. What I wanted to show people is that you can enjoy your favorite foods in moderation, regardless of whether it's a Big Mac or if it's a slice of pizza at your daughter's birthday party or a slice of cake at your nephew's graduation ceremony or you just want to have an ice cream cone because you want an ice cream cone. You can enjoy them without feeling like you screwed up, without feeling like you messed everything up, without feeling like you, you went off track and you should just give up altogether. Because one thing that's not talked about too often is binge eating. And more people struggle with it than I think people realize. And it's, a lot of people are embarrassed that they do it. And just if you look at the behavioral patterns of binge eating, people do it when they're alone, at night, when no one else is there. A lot of times people will deliberately eat less when they're out with friends or family. So when they go home later that night, they can eat more on their own. And uh, a lot of people struggle with it. And a lot of it is born out of this fear of bad foods and inherently bad foods that are going to make you fat and that you ruined your diet from having one bad meal. And what I always say is just like no one ever got skinny from having one salad, no one ever got fat from having one slice of pizza, right? It's just, it's not how it works. So I wanted to show people that even when I was eating one Big Mac, which is like the quintessence of what people believe to be the worst food for you, one Big Mac a day every day for 30 days, I was still just through moderating the rest of my nutrition, eating very healthy, moderating my calorie intake, continuing to strength train, I was still able to lose weight over those 30 days. How many calories was a Big Mac? 540 calories. Some say 540, some say 565, depends on the source, but generally I, I counted it as 540. Did you have a replace a meal? Yeah, basically it replaced a meal. So I'd have a Big Mac every day for lunch. Uh, I would have uh, usually I'd have one big salad every day. So like one big salad with grilled chicken or salmon or whatever on that. Uh, and then my girlfriend would cook for dinner and like she would make whether it's quiche or so what she makes a bunch of different things. But I would have three square meals a day, usually two snacks. The snacks were some type of fruit or a protein. And then one of the meals was the Big Mac. So you ate one Big Mac 30 days and you lost seven pounds. Correct. Yep. Exactly. Do you feel like... Um it gave you extra cravings. So people have this thing where they believe certain carbs uh, encourage you to binge eat. Uh, no, I don't think it gave me extra cravings. But I will tell you this. I didn't have the fries the entire month, right? And that was for a number of reasons. If you add the fries, it adds a significant number of calories, between 300, 500, 700, depending on the size of fries you get. If you look at supersize me, by the rules he laid out for himself, he had to say yes if they asked him to supersize the meal. He's like, I have to. And it painted a very false narrative idea around what it, like, you don't have to say yes. You are an adult. You can say, no, I'm good. Thank you. That being said, every time I walked into McDonald's and the smell of those fries hit my nose, I was like, oh, I want those so bad. But I'm taking responsibility for my actions. And if I'm going to have a Big Mac every day and I want to lose weight at the same time, I should also be responsible for how many calories I'm going to take in. It makes it exponentially more difficult to say no to those French fries when I see them making them and I smell them. But it's not like the Big Mac made me crave them more. It's just my environment. And we can talk about that in all aspects of fitness. Like if you hang out with people who don't work out most of the time, it's going to be very hard for you to work out because they're not prioritizing it. So you're not either. If you're hanging out with people who prioritize working out, you're hanging out with people who prioritize eating well. It's going to be easier for you. So, and yes, I think some foods, like if you have a sugary food, you're probably going to be hungrier sooner. You're going to crave more sugar. But I think a lot of it, we really have to pay more attention to personal responsibility. 
and our own actions and our own choices. And yes, some foods can make it more difficult, but what environment are you putting yourself in? And is that environment leading to more of the issues rather than the actual food per se? Yeah. I don't remember Super Size Me. He didn't track calories though. No, that was... He just <sighs> ate, I think he ate breakfast, lunch, and dinner all at McDonald's and he ate at whatever... Uh... Basically, he had to eat three meals a day, every day at McDonald's. If they asked him to supersize it, he had to say yes. Um, and man, there's so much of that movie that really was not an accurate depiction of what life is really like. Um, for example, when he, when he, I'll never forget this, in one of the first couple of days he was eating and he was like, oh, I'm so stuffed, I feel gross. And he was like halfway done with the meal. He's like, but I gotta finish, it's the rule. I'm like, since when are you forced to force feed yourself? Like. You're taking responsibility away from people. You're making it appear as though this place is inherently bad when reality is, number one, I don't know anyone who would go to McDonald's three times a day every day. Number two is if you're full, put your food down. That's just what an adult does. No, I'm full. I'm going to put my food down. That's it. Don't tell people it's like, oh, well, I have to force, my, force feed myself. And he forced it until he threw up. It's like you're creating a, a very one-sided, very biased view in which Netflix documentaries, they tend to do that. Like they have, this is before Netflix. This, yeah, this is way before. This is on YouTube. <laughs> it's like DVD. I mean, you see it like, but it's funny because people come out and asking now like all these different food documentaries on Netflix and everything. It's like I've ne yet to see a single documentary on food, whether it's Netflix or not, that's actually objective and unbiased. They usually have a narrative to drive home that they want to sort of scare people into believing that things are bad for them or going to kill them or make them fat, whatever it is. The narrative around Super Size Me was fast food is going to kill you. It's awful for you. Never do it. It's going to make you fat. And I, there's, I have no research for this whatsoever, but I would guarantee you that if you look at food fear and food anxiety and binge eating disorder from prior to Super Size Me to after Super Size Me, you would see a huge spike in food fear after that documentary came out simply because it created this one-sided dogmatic view that it's inherently bad for you and you should never, ever, ever eat it. And if you do, you're poisoned. People literally call the food poison. It's like, hmm, really? I don't think it's poisonous. I wouldn't say it's the pinnacle of health, but having one Big Mac isn't going to poison you. The theme of the message was uh, you could eat foods that are relatively considered junk while still uh, pursuing your goals of weight loss. Exactly. And again, the point isn't to say eat McDonald's every day or McDonald's at all. The point is to say if you have a slice of pizza at your daughter's birthday party, don't feel like you have to starve yourself the next day and work out for hours and hours on end to make up for the damage. You didn't do any damage. If you had a slice of pizza, you're fine. And the reality is most people don't achieve their goals not because of one bad meal or because of one week of missed workouts. They don't achieve their goals because they're not consistent for a long period of time. And if someone feels like they failed because they had a slice of pizza or because they had a slice of cake or because they had some ice cream, then they're more likely to just – they're like, well, what's the point? I already – I quit. I already screwed up. You see this every week. People get on track on Monday. They're super rigid and strict throughout the week. Friday comes, they go out to eat, have a couple drinks. Maybe they have too much chips and guac. Like, screw it. I already screwed everything up. I'll just get back on track on Monday. And they justify binging the entire weekend or eating not well the entire weekend just to get back on track on Monday. And they spin their wheels and they never reach their goals. And it's not because of the chips and guac on Friday. It's because they had that and then they thought they failed and just gave up entirely. What would you recommend to someone who's not tracking calories? Do you have all your clients track calories? I would say 97% I do. The people that I don't have track calories are the people who used to and have very obsessive compulsive tendencies where tracking calories can exacerbate disordered eating habits. I don't recommend everyone count calories for the rest of their life, but I do think counting calories for even as little as 30 days or even as little as seven days is enough to show you how big the portion sizes you're actually eating are and to change your perspective. I don't think you need to count calories forever. I don't count calories right now, but I did spend several years counting calories growing up. So now if I look at a plate of food, I can tell you within 50 to 100 calories how much, how many, how much is on it, which allows me to better moderate my portion control and understand whether I'm eating too much or too little or just right. So most people that I work with, I encourage them to count for at least 30 days. And if afterwards they don't want to do it, they don't have to. But at least now they're working or operating from a place of knowledge rather than just guessing. I agree. Growing up, I remember, uh, especially when you're younger and you're an athlete. Mm -hmm. I was an athlete, but I worked out very young. Yeah. And I worked out intensely. You could just kind of get away with eating whatever was on the plate. 
Yeah. And as you get older, you realize, wow, that's a lot of calories. <laughs> it's like, how did I get? How did I get by on that? That's right. So I think, yeah, tracking calories is a great experiment everyone should do. Yeah, it's if for nothing else, in the same way that you don't need to track every single penny in and out of your finances, but if you don't have an idea of how much you have coming in and how much you have going out, you're putting yourself at a massive disadvantage, and it's a little bit scary. And like, you don't know if you're spending more than you're making. You don't. You have no idea. So it's a good idea to track, have a good idea of how much is coming in, coming out. And then over time, you can get more systems in place so that it's almost automatic. Same thing with calories. Track it. Be aware of it. Learn what foods have how many calories. And then after a certain period of time, you won't really have to be as meticulous. But I think a lot of people are averse to it because they're like, oh, well, I don't want to have to treat my food like math. And I'm like, no, you don't have to treat your food like math. Just develop the skill for 30 days. Any, If you aren't willing to spend 30 days to make nutrition for the rest of your life significantly easier and just to give yourself more education, then you can't complain about a lack of progress. Yeah. For a lot of years, I, I was like against it. I was just like, it just sounded so hard. Like, <laughs> oh, I got to track calories. Like, oh, I was too much. Yeah. but uh, you Then you finally that. do it. It's so easy. It's so easy. I mean, uh, I also take into account that I have an easier lifestyle. A lot of people, I kind of like stay, you know, I stay home based. Uh, but again, if you work, if you work uh, away, you could pack your lunch and just track the calories before you throw them in. Yeah. And, if someone's like, listen, I don't, I will not track calories. Like, okay, cool. Write down everything you eat for seven days. Don't even count the calories. Just write down everything you eat. Just track it with a pencil or a pen, whatever, on an app. Most people don't know how much they're eating at all. They yeah. completely and utterly have no idea. And they swear up and down they do. I do, I do, I do. If you swear up and down that you do, and you're still not losing fat in the way that you think you should be, do that for seven days. Honestly. And a lot of people will... They're like, oh, well, I don't need to write that down. It's like they'll like have a dessert or a couple drinks. Like, oh, I don't need to write that down. And conveniently, they forget that they had it. Write everything down for seven days. Guarantee you'll be shocked. And some of those things are like the most calorie dense things. Yep. Like, exactly. Uh, juice. Yeah. Juice. And a lot of times alcohol, people blame alcohol for it, but it's usually not the alcohol. There are some alcoholic drinks, whether it's like a IPA or some beers that are very, very high calorie, even some wine. It's usually what you're eating while you're drinking and after that really adds up. And they combine, they both play into each other. But it's usually not the, the martini. It's probably the pizza and the chips and the everything that you had after. Yeah. How do you recommend people start tracking calories? Uh, well, so, I mean, number one, I think the easiest way is just go to Google. Like, you can literally go to your phone and say, like, hey, or like go to your, hey, Siri or hey, Alexa, like how many calories are in this? And they'll tell you. Like, I didn't know that. Yeah, you literally, hey, we could do it right now. You can literally go, hey, Siri, how many calories are in an apple? And it'll tell you like 80 calories. Like we actually did this experiment during the Big Mac challenge. We would, hey, Siri, how many calories are in a Big Mac? Whatever. And just spits it right out at you. Um, I have, there are a number of apps you can use. My personal favorite is my buddy, Mike Vacanti's. It's Mike's Macros. Very simple, very easy to use. It has a big food database that you can look through. Basically, you type it in and it comes up with uh, uh, the amount of calories that are most likely in it. My Fitness Pal also has a really good food database as well. I'm familiar like, with that. And they actually have a really cool function that you can scan the barcode. So it just pops right in. Um, the reason I like Mike's macros a little bit more is just because the calories and macros that he will tell you to eat are, I like his uh, algorithm to come up with the right amount of calories much more than I like My Fitness Pal. My Fitness Pal is usually just based on gender. If you're a woman, you eat this much. If you're a man, you eat this much. And that's it leaves a lot on the table and a lot of, tells women to eat like 1,200 calories, period. I was going to say, my fitness pal is really aggressive with the, very, with the weight cut. When, and if you think about it, and again, I have no proof for this at all, but if you think about it, you tell someone to eat 1,200 calories, unless they're a very small individual already, they're going to lose weight very quickly. They're going to see that. They're going to be like, oh, this is great. I'm making great progress. My fitness pal is amazing. Then... Whether or not they stick to it, if they end up gaining the weight back, whatever it is, well, what worked for me? Oh, my fitness pal. They go back to it and it keeps using it, keeps using it. I think they use a very steep calorie deficit as a way to sort of drive that positive loop. That, like, oh, this is working. When the reality is Mike's macros, it's a slower, uh, it's a slower fat loss. And sort of my calorie calculation, which I have on YouTube, is a slower fat loss as well. The issue is most people aren't patient enough. And the scale might spike up one day, and they think, oh, it's not working, and then they quit. And it's like the slower tends to be better for the long term, but most people aren't patient enough to really stick with it. Do you recommend they buy a food scale or measuring cups? If you really want to learn, yes. If like you actually want to take it to the degree where you understand how many calories are in certain foods, because 
it's, I'll tell you the first time I started counting calories, I was 18 and I was lean. I was an athlete. I wrestled my whole life. Um, but I really wanted to take it to the next level. I was like, I've always been lean, but I've never gotten shredded. And I wanted to learn how to do it. So I actually hired a guy named Martin Burke, and who's a sweet uh, nutritionist. Lean games. Yeah, exactly. I hired him when I was 18. My story is on his website, like front page. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And when he sent me the guidelines, I was 18, and literally my buddy was like, you have to hire him. I emptied my bank account. I spent, I had 300 bucks in my bank account. This was in like 2000, uh, 2010, I believe, 2010 or 2011. And I was, I had nothing. And, but I, I was, was a coach and I wanted to learn. I was like, how does this guy do it? He has the best results I've ever seen consistently. And so I hired him. I emptied my bank account, 300 bucks for a 12 week program, which really is not much like it's pennies nowadays for an online coach. And, uh, he just sent me my calorie intake, my protein intake and a three day week strength training program. And I was like, that's it. I was eating 1500 calories on my rest days, 1800 calories on my uh, training days. I was like, really, this is all you're giving me. He's like, just do it. Like, stop complaining. Don't give me lip. Just do it. I did it for 12 weeks. I was 100% consistent, and I got shredded a bit. So the pictures are online. And I remember the first week, I, I didn't have a scale to weigh any food. I was just like eyeballing it based on what I thought three ounces of chicken would look like. And the scale wasn't moving as quickly as I thought. And I emailed him, and I was like, hey, this is really not making as much progress as I expected. Meanwhile, it's only a week. He's like, shut up. It's only been a week. But he was like, are you weighing your food? I was like, no. He said, like, get a food scale. So I got one off Amazon for like 20 bucks. And uh, oh, no, I did not have off Amazon at the time. That was at Walgreens. I had it at Walgreens and uh, got it for like 20 bucks. And I remember I weighed my chicken breast for the first time and I was eating about two and a half times what a three ounce serving size was. And I was blown away and also incredibly disheartened and like really demoralized. I was like, what? It's crazy. But uh, that one experience changed my view forever in terms of you could be having quote unquote healthy foods but if you're eating too much energy, you're eating too much energy. You're putting too much into your body and you're not going to make the progress you want, which is why so many people, they never achieve the physique that they want. And it's not for a lack of effort. It's not for a lack of trying. It's not for a lack of necessarily uh, eating high quality foods. It's oftentimes they're just eating too much, even if it is high quality food. Do you feel like that was a steep cup looking back at it now? 1800 calories on the training day and 1500 on the rest day? No, because I'm I'm a, you know I'm short dude. I'm 5 foot 4. I weighed I weighed 100. What was I? I was 100 and I believe 32 pounds when I started with him and I got super lean. I mean, I got to like I think I was 119 or something by the end of it. I was very very small, but I mean, I was deadlifting well over 300 pounds and like I wasn't that experienced in in powerlifting yet. So strength increased, muscle increased, body composition improved, and I got I got probably like six to seven percent body fat. Um, I probably could have had a little bit higher on my rest days, but uh, I also think as a coach, it's hard to find the balance between making enough progress on a consistent basis that keeps people motivated and also keeping it sustainable. Right? It's sort of like that balancing act where some people that will only be motivated if they see rapid fat loss. And other people, they'll stay consistent even if they're not seeing rapid fat loss. So for me, I was in a state of mind where he's the expert. I want to learn from him. I will do whatever he tells me. And because of that, I made amazing progress. I probably could have eaten more and it would have taken maybe another two to three weeks to get the same result. But I mean, what's the rush? There's no end date. Two to three weeks, like doesn't matter. Were you intermittent fasting at the time? Yes, I was. I was. Would you say Lean Gaines is the guy who made Intermittent Fast and Famous? Yes, he was. He yeah. doesn't get the credit enough, He I think. does not. <laughs> and I'm glad you brought that up. I really try and give him as much credit as I can because uh, he. I remember in the early 2000s, bodybuilding.com days, I mean, there were the forums that people were like, you got to eat six meals a day to stoke the metabolic fire. And here comes this guy, Martin Burke, and being like, it's actually not true. I'm looking at the research. Here are my client results. Here's my results. It's just not true. This whole... Uh, this idea of stoking the metabolic fire is actually, it's been misrepresented in the research. And uh, I remember people being like, you're an idiot. You don't know what you're talking about. And then now what? Like 10, 15, 20 years later, everyone's, everyone's doing it. It's yeah. the biggest fad. And, uh, and there are a lot of people who literally took his exact method and just stamped their name on it and oh, said it's his. a lot of people. Yeah. And I'm not going to say any names, but I do try to my best. I mean, I have a whole intermittent fasting video on YouTube that the first probably minute and a half is saying thank you to Martin. Because if it wasn't for him... I think the entire world, the science-based world, wouldn't be where it is today in terms of nutrition. Yeah. All right, back to 
So were you intermittent fasting at the time? Yeah, yeah, I was. So I actually started intermittent fasting in high school. That was part of his program? or oh, Yes. So I, before, I started before him. Uh, I started before I hired him. So, But I didn't use his method when I first started. I first started intermittent fasting when I was in high school for wrestling because one of my wrestling coaches was really into it. He was the one who turned me on to Martin. And, uh, but I, I actually started with a guy named, have you heard of Ori Hoffmeckler's The Warrior Diet? Oh, yeah. yeah. Another one that's actually uh, famous doesn't get the credit. Exactly. He was, he was the first person I ever heard with the one meal a day. Exactly. I think he was the first published author about intermittent fasting. To, I mean, in mainstream books. There has been research on intermittent fasting for yeah, years yeah. and years and years. But I think he wrote the first mainstream book, unless I'm mistaken. Uh, and he was in the Israeli Defense Force, and he had this whole book. There's a lot of misinformation in the book. There's a lot of stuff that is, looking back, is not accurate. But uh, he was correct in saying that you don't need to eat Every, every so often in order to stoke the metabolic fire. The warrior diet is basically you'd fast for 20 hours and then you have a four-hour feeding window, which I hate how they call it fasting feeding. It's like you're eating or you're not eating. That's really what intermittent fasting is. Like sometimes you eat, sometimes you don't eat. Um, you have 20 hours where you don't eat and then you have four hours where basically Ori Hoffmeckler is like, you can eat as much as you want in this four-hour window. And the story that he told in the book about how this is what he did in this really defense force, like it was super, sounds super <laughs> cool, like, oh, wow, like, this is amazing. And there's also something very intriguing about hearing you can eat as much as you want and still get shredded. It is, people are like, really? I'll gladly not eat for 20 hours as, much, as long as I can eat as much as I want. That, I credit that book <laughs> unfortunately, to really being the catalyst for my own binge eating issues because that is literally what most people do with binge eating. It's in ter- maybe they don't fast for 20 hours, but they pick and they, they snack, they have nibbles, they don't really eat much throughout the day, and then at night before bed or sometimes they'll wake up after bed and just go nuts. And that really perpetuated that for me. Um, and then what I ended up doing, I, then I did that through from like 17, 18, hired Martin after that, and then... About a year and a half later or so, I wrote an article in 2012 titled uh, Intermittent Fasting Might Not Be Right for You and That's Okay. And I had already written a number of articles on my experience with intermittent fasting, how much I liked it, but I realized that saving all of my calories for the end of the day was actually doing more harm than good, not from a fat loss perspective, but from a psychological perspective. It was it was encouraging me to binge eat. So I just made a rule. I was like, I'm going to eat breakfast. I have to eat breakfast. And that was what allowed me to stop binge eating. So I, I haven't intermittent fasted for years. I have nothing against it. I think it's really good for some people. And I think if you struggle with disordered eating or binge eating, it's not a good fit. So, so you struggled with binge, binge eating. Yeah. And it started from wrestling. I was, I was a wrestler my whole life. It started when I was eight years old. When I got to high school, I made varsity as a freshman. Uh, I beat a junior out for the varsity spot and I had to cut from 112 to 103 every week, sometimes two to three times a week. So it was big weight cuts. And it was not healthy. I had no idea what I was doing. I was just doing what the juniors and seniors were doing, which was just going in the sauna and cutting five, six, seven, eight pounds of water in several hours and not eating for 24, 48 hours at a time. And, you know, the, the wrestling world, the, the weight cut world, whether it's wrestling or fighting, uh, whether it's, uh, I mean, even crew, they have like serious weight cuts. Uh, there are different, or even actually jockeys, they have to like, they often cut times cut a lot of weight in order to be as light as they can on the horse. Any weight cut sport is like, not the health usually they don't do it the healthiest way to completely sort of veer off some people have died yeah they have and i think uh it's in the wrestling world it's they really encourage it unfortunately uh it was actually very cool to see conor mcgregor fight at a at a heavier weight because he looked incredibly healthy and incredibly strong yeah usually when he fought uh aldo was that his name aldo yep his face was so shrunken in emaciated yeah you can see he fought like I think 145, 155, and just fought at 170. And uh, he looked so healthy, so strong. And I think it's really important for a lot of wrestlers and fighters and people to, to see that because they think that they have to cut 8, 10, 12 pounds of water in order to be able to compete at a high level. But what they don't realize is everyone is dehydrating themselves in order to compete at a lower weight. So then you're literally just competing against people who are your same weight and you're just dehydrated. So I mean, I would wrestle sometimes and... I remember one time I was really sick. I had to cut a lot of weight, and uh, I cut about five pounds in two hours. I was running up and down the stairs in my high school, and uh, by the time I was stepping on the mat to wrestle, I had the worst cramp in my calf I've ever had in my life, and I told my coach, I was like, my calf is about to cramp up, and he goes, you better pin him fast. <laughs> <laughs> and that and, you know, that was the wrestling, uh, it was the 
feeling around it. That was just the tradition around it. It's what you did. But uh, yeah, so that's really how I started to develop very poor relationship with food. And I don't regret it. I don't, I don't wish it happened a different way because so much of what I've been able to do in the fitness industry is because I went through that and I can really empathize with people very deeply and personally if they're going through it as well. How would you describe your binging? What do you mean? Like, uh, so you would cut weight and then your binge would be just right after that trying oh. to put the weight back on? So, so I would say wrestling binges were different than binges post wrestling life. I, like, I could explain both. So, I mean, I would weigh about 112. I was walking around 112 pounds and leading up to a weigh in, I would probably maybe eat 500 calories over the course of 48 hours, 500, 800 calories. And that's also not including I was doing everyday wrestling practice. So two hours, whatever. And, um, and ne like net total, not that many calories. Um, so I would more or less fast for about 48 hours prior to my weigh in and lose a number of pounds. And then if I had three, four, five, six, seven pounds of water to cut left, then I would go through a wrestling practice the night before. And usually just through one wrestling practice, you can sweat out three, four pounds of water. No problem. You just don't drink, which is like, if you want to get a taste of what that's like, do a workout, just a strength training workout and don't get a sip of water throughout the whole thing or even afterwards. So I'm not suggesting that to anybody, but if you want to see what it's <laughs> like, uh, so I would do that. I'd lose eh, three, four, five pounds of water in practice. And that would practice would end around 7 PM. Then, uh, then I wouldn't drink all night. Wouldn't eat. There's something in wrestling called sucking ice where basically, so you don't add too much water weight. If you're just, you have cotton mouth, it's like really dry. You just literally suck ice cubes so that you can get rid of that, uh, awful feeling in your mouth. And then usually they call it floating weight. When you go to bed, you might weigh something and you'll could lose anywhere between half a pound to two pounds, depending on the individual when you just sleep at night. So I would then weigh in ideally on weight and then I would, I'd weigh in and, uh, then I'd binge <laughs> and then I'd go nuts. But the, the issue is, I mean, I would go from, if I weighed in 102.8 pounds for my freshman year at, I don't know, whenever I weighed in, I could be back up to 112 within an hour, like very easy. It's not difficult. I mean, if you look at, uh, I don't know, a 16 ounce bottle of water, you just gained a pound. And if you haven't drank in the better part of 24 hours and you're just so thirsty, you'll chug a number of those very, very quickly. And your body, you're not going to pee it out. You're going you're gonna to hold on to all of it. So binges for wrestling look like that. And then for post wrestling, when I wasn't wrestling anymore, it was more what I think people could probably relate to on a larger scale where, uh, I would nibble throughout the day. I would eat like what I thought was very, very healthy meals. Uh, but when I was with friends and stuff, I wouldn't really eat with them because I was planning for a bigger meal later that night on my own. And then I would save as many calories as I could for nighttime because there was this anxiety around going to bed hungry. I created this anxiety. Like, I don't want to go to bed hungry. I don't want to do that. And uh, then before bedtime, I just like eat well past the point of being, feeling full, like just stomach distended, like feeling super full. And as you're doing it and eating and eating and eating, you're like, why am I doing this? I don't want to be doing this. Like, why am I doing this? But you just can't help it. And, uh, and that's, that happened for a number of years that probably, uh, until I was like 21 and then fortunately got it all in check and haven't, I haven't been now in the better part of a decade, but how did yeah. you get it in check? I stopped in fasting that I remember I, uh, I came home from college for a winter break and I was just I was tired of of not being able to go out with my friends and eat with them like with this fear I, and I realized I was scared of eating breakfast I I remember my mom I'm, my mom would be like do you want to have some breakfast and I was like no and I remember why I was like why am I so scared I had breakfast my whole life until I started minute fasting like people eat breakfast all the time and I was like why am I scared of this that's not okay I was just tired of it. So I remember I went into my mom's bathroom. I looked myself in the mirror. I was like, tomorrow you're eating breakfast. And that was it. I ate breakfast. It was super nerve wracking, anxiety producing, but I forced myself to eat a big breakfast. I haven't really been since. So it was just like uh, you quit cold turkey. Yeah. It's just like I realized that if I kept intermittent fasting because I was scared of eating breakfast, I was going to like, just perpetuate the issue. I was going to exacerbate it. It was going to go on, go on, go on. And I very much believe that sometimes the things that scare you the most are the ones you need to do most because that's usually the thing that's preventing you from moving forward. Were you tracking calories as you're during the binges? Um, I would track calories throughout the day for what I was eating normally. 
and uh, I wouldn't track the calories in the binge. And that's where a lot of people struggle. They'll track their calories during the day and they'll keep it very low on purpose, sort of anticipating an uncontrolled binge that night. And so then when you start binging, I mean, you just you can eat thousands of calories very, very, very quickly. And uh, I could guess how many I had, but I wouldn't count them all. I would, like, I, it was a lot. <laughs> like, and anyone listening who struggles with it knows like you can eat a lot of calories very, very quickly. Uh, even if you don't have binge eating disorder, even if you just like, even if you just eat like an asshole sometimes, <laughs> like sometimes you just eat a ton. And, and that's why I think it's really important to actually track your calories for a little bit so you can be aware of how much you're eating. Do you ever feel hungry when you would uh, scale back calories? Like what would be your advice for that for people that say uh, if you had to cut 500 calories and they get this intense feeling of hunger? So if you're cutting calories, I'm assuming your goal is to lose fat, right? Yeah. So I think it's really important to remember part of fat loss includes a bit of hunger. I think there's a lot of people out there trying to sell you programs like, oh, you can lose fat and all this and you'll never be hungry. You can eat as much as you want. They're lying. It's in the same way, have you ever heard of someone who's trying to gain weight, but they're like, they're just never hungry? Yeah. When you want to lose weight, your body, and, you're, and you cut your calories, your body doesn't want you to lose weight. It's like, it's just not, from an evolutionary perspective, you, it doesn't want you to lose body fat. That's extra energy reserve. Why would you want to do that? So your body is going to increase your hunger hormones because it, it looks at that as a bad thing. It doesn't mean anything bad is happening to your body, but it does mean that you have to know that hunger will happen. In the same way that when you try and gain weight, you're, there's something called homeostasis. Our body wants to stay exactly where it is. It is energy costly to add muscle mass. It's energy costly to change your physiology. So your body wants to stay right where it is, which is why when you try and gain weight, you start eating more. All of a sudden, like it's very difficult to eat more. Like, your body will downregulate your hunger hormones. So I think it's really important to, number one, really understand that have realistic expectations that a little hunger is okay doesn't you're not dying it's not bad it's all right that being said if you are ravenous all the time and if like, you just are just completely and utterly like starving you have to look at the quality of your diet you have to look at the quality of your food are you eating enough fruits and vegetables like are you and one of the things i've recently done on social media is i talk about having one big salad every day people are like well how, how can i like, get my hunger in check it's like and i always ask how many salads are you eating per per week and usually they'll be like um uh, two or three, and usually that means none or one. And it's like, we always hear eat more fruits and vegetables, but not many people actually do it. So for me, just have one salad every day. You can put chicken on it, turkey on it, salmon on it, tofu on it, whatever you want, but just have one meal at least dedicated with a lot of vegetables. And a lot of people are like, well, what kind of salad should I have? It's like, I don't care. Get a lot of vegetables, put them in a bowl, put some protein on it, good to go. Like if you're worrying about what dressing should I use, you're looking at the minutia. Just start with eating more vegetables and protein. That's it. I don't care what dressing you use. Probably wouldn't want you to put like a gallon of blue cheese on it, but like I'll start with that if that means that you're going to start eating more vegetables. Like, so, a, like a soup. Yeah, exactly. Um, so eating more fruits and vegetables, I think one of the easiest things that you can do is just if you're... Fruits and vegetables because they're so cal calorie light but so satiating. Sati that, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yep, they're uh, very nutrient-dense. They have a lot of fiber, which tends to fill you up more. Uh, it's very nutritious for you, and they don't have many calories. Um, it, and it's one of those things where people just, this is the way people, I can look at it, for example, from like a, an avocado perspective. Avocado is a very healthy food. It's also very high in calories. So it's like, this goes to the whole, yes, avocado is actually technically a fruit, but you don't want to eat three whole avocados in a day just because it's a quote unquote healthy fruit. You have to, really make sure I really like to focus on vegetables first and foremost as the base have some fruit as well and I try and have protein at every meal protein is for me it's like the superhero of the macronutrients out of proteins carbs fats protein is number one because it's going to fill you up the most has the highest thermic effect and it's the only macronutrient that can actually help you build and maintain muscle so it's just like you get the trifecta of amazingness with protein and you combine that with vegetables it's going to help you uh, keep hunger at bay and also, I think a lot of people don't drink as much water as they should, or like, whether it's seltzer or water, whatever. If you struggle with hunger, try and drink one glass of water before every meal, and then one after every meal. Like, add that to your routine, and hunger will be significantly easier. Do you have a protein recommendation for your clients? Generally speaking, there's many ways we could go with this. And I'll say, the protein number I'm about to give 
I'm going to have two different equations. It's going to be higher than what scientifically and physiologically you need in order to maintain your muscle. I think it's higher. The reason this is my equation is because it's very easy to remember. And even if you're under it, you're still going to be getting plenty. So the first one is basically I think of if you take your current body weight, and let's say you're, I don't know, 150 pounds, multiply that by one, it's 150. Eat 150 grams of protein a day. That is, uh, not, it doesn't work for everybody. And it specifically doesn't work for people who have a lot of weight to lose. If you are very, very, very heavy and you have a lot of body fat to lose, and I don't know, let's say you're, I don't know, 300 pounds, 350 pounds, do not have 300, 350 grams of protein a day. You don't need that much. For that group, I would say take your goal body weight. Now, and then this brings up a whole separate little, how do I know what my goal body weight is? Like, I don't, it's not that important. You don't have to, number one, you don't have to ever actually achieve that weight in order to succeed. The purpose of saying your goal body weight is because I want you to imagine where you would weigh around your leanest so we can get a better idea of your total lean body mass, of how much actual muscle you have. So maybe if you, in high school, you weighed 185 pounds, but through life you ended up gaining a lot of weight, now you weigh 300 pounds, I would say try and go for maybe your high school weight. 185 grams is a really good thing to go for. But pick a goal weight, multiply that by one, and you're good. Um, and yeah, it's super simple. Generally speaking, for if you look in the research, you could take 0.7 grams of protein per pound of lean body mass, and that's probably more of an accurate depiction of how much you would need from the, to get the most benefit out of it. Uh, and any more than that, it's just redundant. It's not bad for you, but it's redundant. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I'm not a math guy, so I don't know many people who are going to be like, all right, well, I'll take 0.7, multiply that by my lean body mass, and I'm going to figure it out. It's like just one, multiply it by one. It's a significantly easier way to do it. Um, any advice for people that emotionally binge? Is from your background of binging, have you ever thought of? I mean, I, I imagine clients must have uh, approached you with the fact that they may stress eat or depress eat or. Yeah, it's probably one of my biggest uh, conversations, the most common conversations I have with clients and everything. Um, it's a big conversation, right? Like there are many individual factors and, you know, there are people who maybe it's because of uh, issues from the past. Maybe it's because of body image issues. Maybe it's because of trauma in the past, whatever it is. There are so many different reasons for emotional stress eating, binge eating. I don't think this is the end all be all fix for everybody. But I do think, generally speaking, people who really struggle with uh, binge eating, oftentimes they they feel as though once they have one bad food, and I put bad in quotes, they messed up. And they use that mess up as a justification to keep messing up. And I actually really started to realize this in 2012, 2013. I made a video for all of my clients that I would send them. And the first video that I sent any new client it was titled, You Can't F This Up. And I realized that so many people were using these screw-ups as justifications to keep screwing up that that was preventing them from being consistent. So if there's one thing that I can really, really instill in anybody and everybody, regardless of whether or not you binge eat or stress eat, is that you can't screw up. I'm going to say it again because a lot of people hear that like, oh, no, I can really screw up. Like, you don't know how much I can eat. No, 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 you don't understand. You can't screw up as long as you get back on track. That's it. You're never more than one bite away from being right back on track. You're never more than one workout away from being right back in the gym. And you can come up with excuses and justifications all you want to say, well, no, like I screwed up. But the reality is when you're saying I screwed up, and using that as a justification to not get back on track, you're taking the easy way out. It's way easier to say, I screwed up, I call it quits, and just go eat whatever you want, than it is to say, you know what? I had that, I enjoyed it, I made an adult decision, now I'm moving on, I'm back on track. It's the harder choice to get back on track, but you're never more than one bite away, and you cannot screw up as long as you keep doing that. Switching gears, uh, what do you think about fitness influencers on social media, because I've seen you talk about it, a lot. <laughs> and it's it's crazy that it's almost like an unregulated wild wild west industry. Yeah, you could kind of get paid. Like even now, on my emails, I get regular offers to promote the craziest shit, CBD stuff, like a, a constant CBD promo asks. Like yeah, people. Which one? What do you think are the worst offenders of products that are are being promoted irresponsibly? Did you see the BBC? BBC did a, yeah. a story on the fitness influencers. I didn't dive into it. Just like seeing that gave me a mix of anger and anxiety that I just like didn't want to dive into. Uh, 
to give people the gist if they haven't watched it, it was a, a cyanide oh, as an God. ingredient and a supplement. And the supplement only had like five ingredients and three big influencers. I've never heard of them, but they were big. Uh, and they all agreed to promote it even before trying it. It was like an undercover operation where they wanted to out these people who were just promoting stuff for money rather than because it actually worked. And uh, I will say this. I think the vast majority of people on social media are very good. I think that social media has by and large been better for health and fitness than worse there's always going to be some bad people out there doing some uh things with ill intent and not with the the everyone else's best interest at heart but i think by and large most people are good and trying to do good that being said the people who are not doing good really stand out and especially when they have very large audiences and they're trying to make a quick buck off supplements that don't work that could possibly be dangerous things they don't take i mean I mean, I'll say this because I mentioned CBD already. I have nothing against CBD. I have nothing against it. I don't use it, but I'm definitely not going to promote it for a number of reasons, not least of which the research on it is still very up and coming. I think a lot of people, it's very interesting. I never once saw any fitness influencer, or really anybody, athlete, whatever, saying they were using CBD until they started getting paid for it. Now they all have an, a code for it, and they're like, oh, yeah, swipe up, 10% off, CBD, da, 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 whatever. It's like, that's okay. But you really have to look at where their financial investments are and really where they're if, – if someone is, like, swearing up and down, I've used CBD for years, but, like, you've never heard them talk about it before, and, like, they're just swiping up to their discount code, which if you don't know, a discount code means they're getting commission for your purchase. It's like you have to really think, okay, well, what's going on here? I think uh, – this happens with supplements, this happens with like, I don't know, and protein powders, creatines, like all that stuff. And I have nothing against any of that. Um, but just, I think for me, my role as a content creator and as a coach, it's not to start fires. I don't really like to say that person is doing bad or a lot of people will do call out videos on YouTube, like whatever. I'm not a huge fan of that. For me, it's like, I would rather spend my time educating so that people can be informed and critical thinkers and make their own decisions rather than trying to tear other people down. And I think that's, the, if you can take anything, is rather than looking at one individual or one thing as bad, just be a critical thinker and really like do your best to educate yourself and find high quality sources so that when someone does present you with an offer, you can decide for yourself if it's worth it or not. Yeah, I don't, I, I agree of not like, you know, targeting people and making that the, the base of the message. But uh, what are some good tips to avoid certain items that might be questionable? Let's see. Because they have such a huge impact, you know? Like, uh, if you're following someone and they help change your life, you know, even if it's not, like, in person, just from their post and you you resonate with their message. Yeah. And now they're telling you to buy a waist trainer. Oh, God. Okay. I hadn't even <laughs> thought about waist trainers. Yeah, that's nonsense. Yeah, I mean. It's crazy because uh, <laughs> I've been doing fitness for, for over a decade, and I remember waist trainers then were, like, debunked. Yeah. But somehow it made, like, a comeback and so strong of a comeback. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy because I'll put up posts about how waist trainers are ridiculous and don't work. And I'll get people in my comment section being like, that's ridiculous. It does work. Then I'll go to their page and they're selling waist trainers. I'm like, oh, you're angry because this might hurt your business. I have friends and family that like push back on me. <laughs> <laughs> I think also it's an interesting point is maybe even someone who's not selling it, right? But if you buy something, you invest in it and you wear it religiously or use it, you oftentimes develop a, a sense of ego around it. Like it's like you've invested in it. And the idea that maybe someone's saying, oh, this doesn't work is almost this unconscious of, uh, idea of saying, well, like you're wrong or you're stupid or you're ignorant or why did you do that? And sometimes when we're faced with that as individuals, rather than being open-minded and saying, wow, that was a waste of money. I shouldn't have done that. We dig our heels in and say, you don't know it's helped. And it's, which is why it's really important to be very open-minded. And I mean, I'll I'll spot on. Yeah, I mean, I remember, I'll never forget this. I, uh, when I first got into the online world in like 2011, before I even had a website, uh, I started my website in July of 2011. And a little bit before that, I was posting about supplements I was taking. And I said I was taking ZMA uh, for a number of reasons, like for recovery and for, for sleep. And, um, and this doctor, who I'm very friendly with, actually he's friends with Martin too. I saw him when I went up to Sweden. His name is Bojan uh, Kostevsky. He, uh, he messaged me. He was like, you know... Uh, the research around this doesn't really show that it's effective. It's like at all. 
And I know that was one of the first times I noticed myself get really defensive, very be like almost like I wanted to argue back. And I it was almost like there were I was having a conversation with myself. There were like two of me. Like it's like the one of me who wants to get really angry and the other of me that's like, why am I getting defensive when someone just said this doesn't show there's no proof in the research in controlled trials? And so I was like, hey, could you just show them to me, send them to me? And controlled trials show it's really not as effective as a lot of supplement companies make it out to be. Shocker, as most supplements are. And uh, that was a very transformative experience for me in and of itself because I think as individuals, we tend to, whatever we're doing, this, we could see this in, in nutrition, keto, or veganism, or carnivore, whatever it is, whatever you do or invest in and create your identity around, it's very easy to get super defensive about it and defend it to the death and assume everybody else out there is wrong. And anybody who disagrees with you, they're not just disagreeing with you, they're trying to attack you. And then you go at it and you can see this on Instagram and YouTube and Twitter. And Twitter is the worst of it. Like they <laughs> really get nuts on Twitter, but they go at it because it's like, how dare, they're not, even if they're disagreeing, which it's okay, God forbid someone disagrees with you. Emotionally, they're not just saying, they feel like they're not just saying they disagree with you. They're like, they're attacking you. And you have to be very consciously aware of your emotional response to that type of thing because it's a dangerous road to go down. And I think it's why anytime you get angry or upset or defensive, pause and think, okay, is, does this warrant really getting mad about or could we have an open discussion about this dis disagreement? And even if we don't agree by the end of it, that's okay. We're adults. We can disagree on things. Yeah. So again, is there anything that you see promoted heavily on social media that you would advise against? I would say waste trainers are a waste, like literal trash. There's no reason to do it. Uh, How about people that said they use it for their posture? I don't know of any research showing waist trainers improve posture whatsoever. I've gotten that before when I said something about it not removing fat, and they were like... Oh. It, it definitely does not remove fat, not to mention wrapping something around your waist, there's actually a significant amount of research that it can damage your internal organs. In terms of improving your posture, what posture are you improving in your lumbar? That's just, no. Most people, their posture is their upper back. And for me, I'm like, if you want to improve your posture, do that with mobility and strength training. Don't You don't rely on something to wrap around your body to improve your posture. That makes zero sense. You improve your posture by improving your mobility and then strengthening it. It's like, that doesn't make, it's it's them trying to find reasons to justify using it when in reality it doesn't work. Say the detox teas and boom bods and cleanses and all those things are doing way more harm than good. They definitely don't work. Um, I, I mean, this this isn't something that people really invest too much money in, I hope, but the whole celery juice cleanse is this idea that celery juice can cure you. I, I literally had one person tell me that celery juice can help people who are disabled become, we can walk again. And I remember just being, I, I had this screenshot, it, like I was bewildered and someone who actually was disabled was unbelievably like, furious, rightfully so. Like how dare you, like there's one guy, uh, I'm not gonna say his name, who really pushes the celery juice hard. He blocked me because I went really hard on the celery juice thing being like, listen, if you like celery juice, great, drink it. That's totally fine. It will not cure you, uh, like it doesn't, it doesn't make you burn fat. I know some people have seen wonderful benefits with their skin, which is great. I'm not a skin expert. I'm not a dermatologist. Talk to your dermatologist about that. But whether it's apple cider vinegar, celery juice, it's detox cleanses, juice cleanses, whatever it is, none of that is going to cure you of any, like it's, it's just not. You have to be very careful with your words matter. Be very careful with what you're saying and, and how you're number one, telling people, telling people things work. And also as you're taking it in, like if someone says, well, this will cure you of all your ailments, it's a hefty claim. So I would just be wary of that. And I think for me, whether it's supplements or things you're buying, nothing is better than whole minimally processed foods, working out regularly, strength training, doing some cardio, getting enough sleep. Like, that's it. Like As long as you're doing that, you're good. If you're spending a lot of money on supplements or uh, wraps or whatever it is, and you're not consistent with your workouts and you're not consistent with your nutrition, like, you're wasting your time. Which is a big chunk of it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. If someone came to you and said how they should start working out, how would you tell them? How would you coach them through it? Let's say, uh, let's give this hypothetical person. They had a fitness background in uh, high school. They played sports. Yep. They dabbled with the gym but never went fully on. But they could manage maybe like 10, 15 push-ups. And they just, they want to get in shape. Okay. And they haven't been in the gym in years. Let's do it one year. 
Okay, one year. So they do have a gym background. Yeah. Okay. And they're not like petrified of going to the gym. Like they're not nervous about people judging them. Like they're like, okay, I can go to the gym. I just don't know what to do. That's interesting. <laughs> uh, let's do a hypothetical for each of those people. Okay. So I would say for the person who's petrified of going to the gym and like scared of being judged and scared of people, what they're going to think about them. Number one, I think the first thing to say is no one cares what you're doing in the gym. And the vast majority of people will be very encouraging and supportive. No one cares. The gym is actually, ironically, full of insecure people. It's like the gym is just, it's a farm of insecurity. It's where it's it. It's where we hang out. That's where we hang out. And everyone is so focused on themselves that they don't have enough time or energy to focus on you. And if they are that one obnoxious person, it's like the way I frame it is this. When you're 90 years old, are you going to look back on your life and be proud of yourself that you didn't go to the gym because you were worried about what someone might think of you or will you be proud that you go to the gym no matter what, regardless of what someone says? And the answer is always you're more proud of the decision when you do it despite what someone might say. That being said, I still know there will be people who that's not enough to get them to go to the gym because they're petrified. So I'd rather you do something than nothing. And I think I'm one of the biggest proponents of just walking. Literally just start with walking because if you're doing nothing, I think many people massively underestimate the health benefits and psychological benefits of walking, cellular benefits, the emotional benefits, the endorphin aspect, like it is incredible. So if you're not doing anything and you don't know where to start, you can always start with walking. I think a lot of people, they struggle with motivation to do anything. It's like, start with five minutes of walking a day. Usually those five minutes will turn into more. If you don't, fine. If you just keep it to five, five minutes is better than nothing, but start with that and you never know where that will lead in a year, two years, three years. I think a lot of people, they're they're in a rush. Well, I got to reach my goal very quickly. Why? What's the rush? Hopefully you're going to be here for a long time. It's like if you start with walking for six months and then in six months you end up doing a little bit of jogging and then in a year you end up going to the gym two times a week, like great, it's incredible. Um, so yeah, it's, I would say for someone who's petrified of going to the gym and they don't know where to start, just begin with walking. Simple as that. Um, if you want to do some body weight squats, if you want to do some shoulder raises with water bottles, whatever it is, it's great, but keep it simple. For the person who is okay to go to the gym and they have a gym background and they, they know what generally what movements to do, but they don't really know where to begin, I would say start with something that's probably about two to three days a week. Just start with that. You could do a two-day week program that's more full body based. You could call it Monday and Thursday, full body. Uh, and you could do a three-day week that I split it up usually by lower body Monday, upper body Wednesday, full body Friday. I like that split. And uh, generally starting off with some big compound movements and doesn't have to be, like you don't have to be a world record lifter, but some kind type of a squat, some type of a deadlift or a Romanian deadlift, uh, some type of a push up, some type of a, either a chin up or a lat pull down if you can't do chin ups. You don't need many exercises. Between three to six exercises a day is plenty. Get a little bit of cardio in at the end, some walking if you want to. If you want to do running or sprints, you can. They're not inherently better. Uh, but do some strength training. Do some cardio. You're good. You would say sprinting is better for time, though, if you're on a time budget. I would say if you're on a time budget, absolutely. But I would also say if you're significantly overweight or you have some joint issues, that I would rather you take more time and not injure yourself uh, because obviously injuring yourself is going to keep you out of the gym longer. Uh, I think also a lot of people, and this just comes from years of coaching and coaching, that some people get, they're totally fine walking at the gym, but sprinting, they get self-conscious, whether it's because they think they look awkward or because they think that their fat is jiggling or whatever it is, and then so they just don't do anything at all. It's like, if you could sprint for five minutes, cool. If you'd rather walk for 15 minutes because that makes you more comfortable, great. You're going to get health benefits from both. Um, generally, sprinting I save for more advanced athletes and, and trainees. Uh, sprinting is arguably the most high force, high power, high impact drill in the world. Sprinting and jumping. It's like, it is the, it's, it's incredibly advanced. And it's interesting because we see kids do it all the day, all the time. Kids run and sprint and juke and like, it's amazing what they do. And then we get to be adults and we've sat on our butts for a little while and all of a sudden we do it and we blow our knee out. Just like we just forget. We, we, not that we forget, but we don't realize that our bodies were adapted to that type of activity. And if you just go in and try and sprint right off the bat, you're way more likely to tear your hamstring or hurt your knee or whatever it is. I'd rather you build up slowly. It's like, that's what we did in life, right? You First you crawl, then you walk, then you jog, 
then you run, then you sprint. It's a slow progression. And then people take five years off and they come back like, all right, I'm gonna sprint like I did when I was in high school. <laughs> and they join a they join a flag football league and they just tear their hamstring off, or they join a softball league and they tear their rotator cuff. They are trying to throw something from center field like they did in high school, and it's been twelve years. Relax. Don't do that. The same hypothetical person has a hundred dollars and he wants to spend it on being healthier. How should he spend it? Man. Three hundred dollars. So Three hundred bucks. I would say, I would say $300. Gym membership? I would say gym membership, yeah. I was going to say or home equipment, but you can't get that much home equipment for 300 You can get some. Some but, dumbbells. Uh, yeah, you get some dumbbells. You can get some, like, power blocks. Like, But I would say, uh, I mean, there are gym memberships for 10 bucks a month, 20 bucks a month. Like, that can go a long way for 300 bucks. They get a gym membership. Um, I think that's probably like what I would absolutely say for sure. And and maybe even uh invest in a in a program. If you can't get a coach, invest in a in a program that's relatively inexpensive. You can find ebooks online, whatever it is. You, or there are plenty of free programs too. But invest in a program. I think this is one of the most overlooked things. People go to the gym, they have no idea what they're doing. They have no schedule. They're just like, oh I'm gonna go in. I see I see people doing the same workout every day for years. Every time they go to the gym, they do the same sets, the same reps, the same exercises, and it's better than nothing. But I think one of the reasons that people lack motivation and intensity at the gym is because they don't have a plan. And that lack of plan oftentimes is as a result, of, it, it, causes, it doesn't cause a lack of goal, but when you have a plan, it gives you the opportunity to create a goal, right? Where you, have, you know that for the next four weeks, you're going to be doing this program. Then every week, you can try and increase. You can try and get stronger. You can get better. In the next four weeks, you go to a new plan. When you have a plan and an aim, it's much more likely to motivate you to go harder, higher intensity, progressively overload. And I think I mean, you could get those for five bucks, 10 bucks, 19 bucks online. And I think just having several of those you cycle through can be incredibly beneficial. So a gym membership, the workout program? Yeah, I, I mean, honestly like- You saved this person a lot of money. Yeah, I, <laughs> I would rather, I, I definitely wouldn't recommend getting a waist trainer or I mean, if you want to get some protein powder to make it easier and more convenient to get protein in, great. I don't think you need it. Um, I don't know. Maybe if you have someone on on social media that you admire, who's like very, uh, very uh, intelligent, reach out and ask if you can pay for a consult so that they can do your macros or so you can pick their brain. I mean, for me, I think we oftentimes just want to buy things, whether it's supplements or whatever, things that make it easier. When the reality is, knowledge is really going to be our greatest benefit because from not does nothing happens without action but if your action is on the right on the wrong track and you're going the wrong direction it's not going to help so i mean when i was a 14 year old kid i got my first internship at a, at a gym it was one of the best things i ever did for my life because i just hung out with coaches who were way better than me and i just learned and learned and learned if, if you can get on the phone with someone that you admire for 30 minutes and pick their brain and pay for their time you're going to be set up for a lot of success because you're going to be, feel a lot more confident that what you're doing is right. That's awesome. Uh, what What's your personal split now? So right now, I'm actually I'm doing both jujitsu and strength training. So I do jujitsu three to four days a week, and I do strength training about three days, uh, and that's really it. So for me, jujitsu I do it in the morning, uh, seven a.m. to eight a.m. Monday through Thursday, and then usually. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I'll do my strength or I'll have one double session. I'll do one a jujitsu in the morning and then later in the day I'll do strength. But my strength workouts are about 30 to 45 minutes right now. Are they full body? Um, yes, they're full body. Yep. What do you train? Um, 30, I, 40 minutes is like a small, not where, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> uh, what do you train? Like what exercises do you pick to do in 30, 40 minutes? Because it's not a, I'm guessing not a wide variety. No, no, it's usually about four exercises, uh, four exercises per workout between depending on the exercise and where it is in the program between sometimes I'll do one set sometimes I'll do up to three or four sets uh, usually earlier on it'll be three to four sets for a main strength move whether it's squats or single leg RDLs or dumbbell rows or something big compound movement then if I'm doing something like a, a shoulder burnout for example at one set of like a hundred reps something like that just like to really just get a lot of a lot of metabolic stress in the muscles uh, but that is the progression usually goes more sets, lower reps, heavier weight at the beginning, fewer sets, higher reps, lighter weight towards the end of the workout. Your pyramid. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Is there a reason you're, you're running this schedule? I mean, this program? 
Um, mainly because I'm jujitsu is my main focus. So I actually I'm gonna have my first competition in March, March, nice. March 28th. Super excited about it. Um, and it's really interesting. I mean, I was an elite power lifter. I deadlifted four times my body weight. Like powerlifting was my life for years and years and years. After I deadlifted 530 at a body weight of 132, I lost a lot of motivation. I was like, what now? And I definitely didn't want to be keep lifting that amount of weight. It was just, it just was brutal on my body, brutal on my mind. Just like loading up that much weight takes a lot of time. Just the deadlift portion of my workouts would take an hour sometimes just to load wow. all the weight on the bar. Like it was a lot. And that was when I was competing as an elite power lifter. Once that goal had been achieved, it's a goal I'd had for a long, like many, 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 many years. I was like, what do I do now? And I was sort of in a limbo and I was coaching Gary Vaynerchuk and it was just like, I didn't have a goal or a name. And now that I have a competition with jujitsu, my motivation's the highest it's been in a year since I really hit that hit that deadlift. So uh, jujitsu is my main focus, and everything I'm doing is based around making sure that that is optimized. Which means I'm doing a lot more mobility work. Uh, I am doing significantly more cardio, just getting more steps in every day. Uh, the law of specificity always holds true, right? So I'd rather do more jujitsu than strength training because right now I'm a white belt in jujitsu. I suck. Like I really need to get good. Getting stronger for me right now will not benefit my jujitsu. Like, I'm stronger than many black belts, but if I go up against someone who's been doing it for six months more than me, I'm done, regardless of whether or not I'm stronger. They're just better skill-wise. So I do a lot of skill work there, and then the strength training is more to maintain my strength, stay healthy. I remember I did. A, I used to practice MMA, and my teacher used to always tap me out. And he, he was an older guy, <laughs> that's awesome, like fifty plus, and on a regular basis, I'll tap. He went out super confident. I'm like, I'm gonna win this one, and just. Did you compete? No, no. Got I was it, just like it. sparring. That's I awesome. wanted to compete, but it was around the same time Barstar took off. and Got it. You yeah. know, getting really good at calisthenics is a, a big time investment in itself. Yeah. So I had to pick. It is. If you only had to, if you're only able to do four exercises, what would it be? It's a great question. I would say, fortunately, we don't only have to choose four in our life, but I would say deadlifts for sure. And people are like, well, what variation of deadlifts? I don't care. Do it. I prefer sumo deadlift. Uh, usually more of a moderate stance. It's easier on the hips. Uh, but sumo deadlifts for me, Bulgarian split squats, chin ups, and single arm dumbbell bench presses. Single arm dumbbell. Wow. B bench press. I've yeah. never done that before. It's it lights your abs up. It's I really like that because you have some type of squat, some type of deadlift, some type of pull. I think chin ups are arguably the best upper back exercise you can do. Um, I love push-ups, but you're usually limited by how much you can load up on it. So I wanted a, a horizontal pressing option, but I also wanted some core in there as well. And when you do a single arm, your abs are going to be wrecked the next day. It has that anti-rotation component that really leads to not only improved pressing strength, but also core strength. Last question. Um, what's the advice you would give to someone who comes up to you and goes, I want to transform my body? They're slightly overweight and they want to get, and then we'll do the same question for someone who's thin and wants to get bigger. I love that. I love that distinction. I would say someone who's wants to lose some weight, want to transform your body. I would say number one, start tracking your calories. It doesn't have to be forever, but track. Just get an understanding of how much you're eating. If you want to lose weight, you have to be in a calorie deficit. The majority of your diet should be whole, minimally processed foods, lots of fruits and vegetables, lean proteins. Get your nutrition in check first and foremost. I'd say one of my, my good friends, Susan Niebergall, she always says nutrition is the driver of fat loss and training is the passenger. I think it's a really good way to look at it. That's awesome. Right? It's, it's, it's genius, and I love that she says it. She, uh, basically, so basically when the goal is fat loss, focus on your nutrition, use strength training and exercise as a supplement. When the goal is building muscle, I like to switch it. Basically, training is the driver when you want to build muscle and get bigger and nutrition is the passenger. The reason I say that is not because nutrition isn't important. It is. When you're trying to build muscle, it's very important. But you can be less meticulous. You can have a little bit more leeway, and you're okay. If you're trying to get bigger, you already understand it's okay to put on some body fat. right? Some people are like, oh, I don't ever want to get at any, any body fat when I'm trying to build muscle. It's like, then you're never going to build muscle. If all you're focused on is, never, is making sure you have visible abs year-round, you're never going to put on any meaningful amount of muscle. And I would also ask yourself, why is it so important for you to never, ever not have visible abs? Like, deeply, why? 
is that an insecurity? Is that like, is, is having visible abs making you a better person? Is it making you a happier person, more fulfilled person? And if you really want to build muscle, you should get comfortable. It doesn't mean you have to be fat. It doesn't mean you have to add 50 pounds. But adding 5, 10 pounds over the course of six months or so in order to get bigger and stronger and then cut back down later, it sets you up for success in life, and especially fitness and, and bulking. So Do you think it's sustainable to hold a six-pack for, uh, for, let's say, a decade? If you are the genetic elite, there are some people, yes. The reason I bring that up because I remember uh, I seen a post from you that you talked about how you like to eat pizza instead of having a six pack. Yes. Can you explain that a little bit more? Absolutely. I think it's really important. I think, number one, social media and and models and all this stuff, it creates this false sense of reality, like what's actually achievable, not to mention aside. It's so funny. People are like, oh, I just want to look like them. I'm like, listen, you took a selfie earlier today. You took 22 pictures of yourself to try and find the best one. And you set yourself up in a way to make it look like you didn't have a double chin and all this other stuff. Like if you're taking angles here and trying to get the best lighting and you're using filters, I guarantee you that the model on the beach with chiseled abs that looks ridiculous, not only did that with the professional editor, but they spent a significant amount of time leading up to that photo shoot to look like that. Nothing's wrong with that if that's your life and that's what you love and enjoy. Go for it. I support you. But we have to look at globally expectations, what most people can actually do what they want to do, what they're willing to do. And they don't understand how much time and effort and work goes into that. It's unbelievable. And I give these people all the credit in the world because they're sacrificing a lot and they're working incredibly hard. But most people, when push comes to shove, they're not willing to do what it takes to maintain that level of leanness year round. And the rea- personally, unless you are genetically, among the genetically who can maintain that low body fat without it affecting your libido, without it affecting your your uh, your mentality, your emotions, and you can do it without much issue, then that's great if you can, but most people can't. I think having too low a body fat year round, it really often does struggle with, uh, affect your hormones. It does affect your libido. It can affect your concentration. Oftentimes you really struggle with hunger. Uh, I mean, I don't, if I'm going to do a 12 week fat loss phase, yeah, I can put up with some hunger for 12 weeks. It's fine. But there's, I see no reason for anybody to be hungry all the time. Like, why would you do that? And for me, it's like, going back to the original question, is it making you a better person? For me, no, it's not. And it took me reaching that level of leanness to realize that. Like sometimes, I'll never tell someone not to do it because you learn through the process of doing it. But I think you have to ask yourself, why do you want to? How will you be better because of it? And what will you do once you've done it? And really be honest with yourself to really come up with your own answer. Perfect. All right, Jordan, thank you. Uh, let us know where we could follow you and uh, where we could support you. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. This was a blast. I really appreciate it. I do a lot of podcasts, and your questions were amazing. So a huge thank you. This is, I'll definitely be sharing this on social media. I have uh, my own podcast, The Jordan Syatt Mini Podcast. Uh, it's just S-Y-A-T-T. Um, I have Instagram, Syatt Fitness, YouTube, Jordan Syatt. So if you Google my name, I'm all over the place. Can't miss them. <laughs> I really thank you so much for having me on. Thank this you. Was great. Pleasure.